Yes, good. Good, thank you. I was a school, I taught school for 20 years, so I had that teacher voice. So hopefully that will serve me well today. I see a lot of familiar faces out there today. Many of you have eaten in my tea room many, many times. I see some I see some uh, frequent flyers out there who ate at the tea room very, very often. It is so good to see everyone. I see old classmates out here, probably four or five of you from Greenville High School, and it's just been wonderful. I'm staying with my very, very best friend all my life from fourth grade all the way through Ole Miss, and that's Jackie. Used to be Jackie Shepherd. She's Jackie Beckwith now, and her husband Bill was a good friend of Sam, so we're doing a lot of catching up, and thank y'all for, for hosting us while we're here in Oxford. I appreciate it. A lot of you know the story. I think just about all of you know at least part of the story um, about what happened at the winery rushing in 1990. My husband Sam and I started the winery in 1977. We were fresh out of college uh, the year before, and we weren't really sure what we were going to do with a sm our small farm which was my husband's grandfather's farm, which was right on the banks of the Sunflower River, uh, between Marigold and Drew, on the, about three miles east of Marigold. And we had, uh, we had a lot of, drank a lot of wine and made a lot of decisions, one of which was to do uh, a winery there on the banks of the river. It was, in retrospect, I, I looked at, in retrospect, I think, that was really a dumb thing to try to do, open up a winery and a restaurant in the middle of a, a lonely cotton field, but we did. We had tremendous support, and it, it took off pretty quickly. Over the next 14 years, we won uh, eight national awards for excellence, which we were very proud of. About six years after we opened, we, uh, after we opened the winery, we uh, opened Top of the Cellar Tea Room, which was right next to the winery. So the typical person could come in, tour the winery, and then go have lunch. And then after that, they would get to McCarty's just in time to see Lee get up from lunch and, and his nap. And, and um, it was just quite the delightful day in, in Marigold, and, and I missed those days terribly. Unfortunately, in March of 1990, our tour guide, whose name was Ray Russell, uh, broke in, he, he broke, in March of 1990, he didn't break in. That's when we came home and found our little puppy named Socks shot and left on our front porch. That was the first of a series of events, of events which were, were quite heartbreaking. It was four weeks later after we fired him for that and also for trafficking drugs in the parking lot of the winery. All of that kind of manifested that same weekend that we found that we found socks, we fired him, and for the next nine months, he spent all of his time and energy pretty much terrorizing uh, the winery, my husband Sam and me, and my young family at the time. We came in on the morning of March 4th to the winery to find all of our wine vats open in the cellar, $8,000, I mean 8,000 gallons of wine trickling down the drain, literally into the Sunflower River. I remember the sheriff went to the edge and said, the, the water is running red, and it was. It, it, it looked almost biblical. It was, it was just bizarre to see the, the wine trickling into the river. We went over to the tea room where we found the tea room totally destroyed as well. He had broken every pane of glass in every window. He had uh, burst a lot of the pottery, a lot of the dishes that were there. It was a, uh, I mean, I really can't even wrap my brain around a lot of, of how I felt at that time. The entire crime, he was arrested that evening. Uh, the entire crime was, ended up being the theft of $401 that he took because they said that there really was no charge for letting wine go down the drain. We had no insurance for anything that covered this. The only insurance we had at that time was fire insurance. So we were at a, a real loss as to what we were gonna do with our lives. Fortunately, the community in the, of Marigold, Cleveland, Drew, the entire area, Clarksdale, the entire area stepped forward and 
for the next two weeks, we would come to the winery to try to start rebuilding. We would find a pallet of wood or a, or just or sometimes cash there anonymously given that we still don't know who was contributing to get us back on our feet. We did rebuild within a couple of weeks everything, of course, the wine inventory. That was going to take a lot longer. We had, of course, our vineyards were fine, but we, it takes a long time to turn a grape into wine and, and for to get it palatable. So we uh, got to work. We got back on our feet. We had every intention of staying. We had a great summer. Uh, some people supporting us, people coming, buy, buying everything they could except wine. We didn't have any wine, but it was, it was quite gratifying to experience that. Eventually, in December of that year, we had uh, the trial. I've had five people, one of whom is in the audience today, who said, I was called for jury duty, and they asked did we, if, if I knew you. And I said, of course, I knew. I eat out there. I drink their wine. And so by the time they found 12 people who had no connection to us in this tiny little community, it wasn't what I would call a jury of anyone's peers. The whole thing became uh, not, not about, not about uh, justice or the, the complete destruction of a very established business. It became more of the haves versus the have-nots, and we weren't prepared for that. I wore my grandma's pearls to the trial. I had my silk dress on. I had new high heels, and I came in there just acting this cocky like everybody thought it was going to be a slam dunk, myself included. We were shocked when they came back with a, a verdict of not guilty, of course. When they came back with the verdict of not guilty, I remember Sam and I went home that night, and Sam said either, speaking of Sam, please welcome him. He's in the back, let him talk. There he is. <laughs> My husband of 50 years plus. So Sam said, Di, he is, Ray is either going to take this as a red light to leave us alone. He got off very easily this time, and I don't know if, if he would do it again, or he'll take it a green light to continue to terrorize us. During that interim period, he had been terrorizing us day after day, day after day. He would do things such as when I would go from Marigold to pick up my children at school, he would be waiting for us right across the bridge. He, li he lived probably a thousand yards from us, right across the Sunflower River. We could literally hear what was going on at his house. He would wait at the bridge until I pulled out, and then he would pull in front of me and slow down. And, and then I would slow down behind him, and then he would go, and then I would go, and I would try to turn around, and he would back up and block me. It was, it was a, a terrifying road rage experience that I had to go through that entire uh, fall after school started in, in September. The children were, we were all really punchy, needless to say, by the time the trial rolled around. Five days after the trial, uh, I was getting ready to go to Memphis to an appointment that I had up there, and Sam came in and he said, Doc, I just found Sassy. Sassy was our black lab go, uh, puppy that we had gotten to replace socks. She's been shot in the heart and put in our garbage can. That morning is when we decided we, we could no longer stay. It was a tough decision. I write about this in my book. I wish I could say that it was an easy decision to do the right thing, but it was not. We were having offers from all over the place. Well, we can take care of him. Some people just need killing. You know, you know what I'm saying. And it was like, well, yeah, maybe so. But, you know, if you really sit down and put a pencil to it, right is right and wrong is wrong and murder is wrong. I don't care, I don't care where you're coming from. So I call that chapter standing on the corner of right and wrong. And it was, it was a hard decision. We didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave our home, our school anything about our lives. We loved our, li our lives there. But we knew we had to. And people say, why Colorado? At that time, at that moment, when we were driving, 
It was real funny. Sam was completely quiet in the car, and we had just passed the crossroads where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. We had just passed that, and I said, Sam, we're moving. It was like a, it was almost like I didn't even know where that was coming from. And he said, what? I said, we're moving. And he thought just a minute, he said, okay. He said, where? And I said, we're moving to Colorado. And he said, Colorado? It was the, the farthest place I could think of that I had <laughs> enjoyed, you know, life, you know. And I was thinking, yeah, Colorado. So that crazy thing turned into a reality. Two weeks later, we were on the road in the middle of uh, Christmas break, making our way towards Colorado, where we landed in Uray, Colorado, which is in southwest Colorado. About uh, eight years ago, a friend of mine from the Delta, Tony Scarborough, who was the physics professor at Delta State, sent me a clipping uh, about a triple murder in Marigold. And I'm, I'm not going to, to go into it, but at the moment that I read about that, which involved Ray and his family, I was able, I, I had a very uh, strange epiphany. I thought that I had been over this for a long, long time and, and no longer afraid or no longer worried that I was going to walk out my front door and see Ray Russell standing there with a shotgun. I didn't realize I still had those thoughts, really. But uh, when I heard the news about the triple murder in Marigold, I could feel that tiny last little sliver of fear just float away. And I wish I could say that I would have written this book had that not ha happened, but that, wouldn't, that would be very disingenuous of me. I don't think I would have had the courage to write this book had that not happened. I, I certainly wouldn't be standing here back in Mississippi had that not happened. But it's been, it's been a wonderful experience for me. People ask, has it been cathartic? No, it hasn't been cathartic. I was over this for the most part, a long time ago. So I can't say that it's been, it was a relief to write the book. I think the thing that I kept rediscovering over and over was not um, a feeling of relief or, or schadenfreude or anything like that. It was more a sense of gratitude for the people that we left behind who continued to support us long after we were gone. And then Coming back to the Delta last week, I started in Cleveland. I've been working my way through the Delta. That that uh, feeling of gratitude and the feeling that I lo of love that I still feel when I'm here is is just unsurpassable. And I, I don't know if people are aware of, of it, but the Delta is still it's still that way. And, and I, a lot of you are from the Delta who live here in Oxford. I know that. So it's something that, to be very grateful for. So I think my takeaway, if anything, was gratitude. I'm going to read a, a short passage about the, the last time we pulled away from our home at the winery. Our home was just right down the road, probably. I measure everything in football fields. I think it was about two football fields from the winery to our house. And so I'm going to read a passage at the very end of the book, which was our last time to leave, and, and kind of my coming to peace about, about a lot of this. So if you will bear with me, I'll read it, and then we'll have a little question and answer or discussion or whatever you want to do. And please come up with questions, because it's quite embarrassing when I'm looking out there and nobody has any questions. <laughs> so anyway. Fake it anyway, if you have to. <clears throat> My family never saw Ray or his father again after, after we pulled away from our home for the last time over three decades ago. For a long time, the voice in my head pummeled my conscience as I struggled hard to forgive. I had been taught all my life to forgive and forget that to forgive was divine. Have I finally been able to reach that noble goal after all these years? The answer is, nope, afraid not. Not by most standards anyway. It depends on one's definition of forgiveness, I suppose. If it requires feeling all warm and fuzzy about Ray 
and truly forgetting his terrifying acts against my family, I can say with certainty that will never happen. If it requires telling him out loud that I forgive him, well, what would be the point? I doubt he cared whether we forgave him or not. Fair enough, I guess. What Ray and his father thought of us is none of my business. I can't say that none of us have ever felt hatred for him, though. Fear, yes. Anger, most decidedly, but not hatred. Frankly, we just didn't have the energy for that. But if forgiveness means letting go of the animosity, the bitterness, then all four of us arrived there a long time ago. I eventually concluded that it's okay not to forgive Ray. Instead, I decided never to give him permission to take up real estate in my head again. Make no mistake, this was no grandiose attempt towards altruism on my part. It was, simply put, a survival mechanism. Sometimes forgiving someone who has wronged you is a selfish act. Carrying that burden would have been much more detrimental to us than to anyone else. Months, sometimes years, have gone by without my even thinking of Ray or his father. Probably the thing that helped my family the most, though, was that we came out just fine on the other side. We found a lot of love waiting for us in URA, and that made it much easier to move on past those terrible days of 1990. I don't dream about Ray slinking around the winery at night anymore either, although I did for several years. For a while, I secretly feared that he may follow us, trying to finish what he had set out to do in the Delta. But deep down, I doubted it. He wasn't one to venture out much. The horrifying dream that had kept me awake every night that summer long ago finally faded into obscurity. My recurring dreams these days involve subbing senior English at Uray High School and something about a novel by Marcel Proust. <laughs> one summer day in 2015, I was happy to see a letter from the Delta sitting in our mailbox. It was from Shelley's father, who had been a good friend of mine for many years. I knew that he had recently retired as a physics professor at Delta State, and I was curious to learn how retirement suited him. In the brief note, he said, here is a snippet from yesterday's newspaper that you will find interesting. Glancing at the headline as I refilled my coffee cup, I wondered why he had sent it. Who the hell was Kenneth Ackridge? So, you'll have to do <laughs> Obviously, I've left out a great deal of teaching career I enjoyed in the Ray for 20 years. My husband's a glass, he was a glass blower in Colorado. He did that for 27 years. A lot, a lot went on in that time. But uh, this is still home in a lot of ways to, to me. So, any questions, please? I would love to answer them for you. Okay? Okay. What, what was it like for you? Okay. Is that you, Celia? It is. Okay. I went to high school soon. Uh, it was interesting. I had no intention of doing this, and that's the honest truth. During COVID, I decided, I mean, I was just sitting around gaining weight like everybody else, just doing nothing. I didn't watch Tiger or whatever that was. Thank goodness. I didn't make any bread, but other than that, I'm a pretty, pretty typical person. So uh, I decided to go clean out the attic. And so I went up to the attic and just found, and I was kind of going through things, and I just found box after box of newspaper articles that had been chronicled our journey from the time we opened in 1977 all the way through the break-in, through the trial, through our leaving, and even a few things after that uh, that, that would, every once in a while people would touch base and see how we were doing and write a little article about it. And so I sat down on the floor of the attic and, and uh, started reading through it. And my first thought was, I really need to make sense of this for my children and my grandchildren because my grandchildren knew nothing about it. My children were six and eight when it happened, so they were certainly had, didn't remember the whole the whole story. They had heard us talk about it, 
Some of my students knew a little bit about it. When I was feeling sorry for myself, I would tell them the story to get them to straighten up a little bit. About that one. So, you know, some people knew uh, bits and pieces. But I just went and sat down, and I got my computer, and just kind of started writing. And then I started, every time I read an article or would write something, it would really jog my memory to go and, and remember something else. And the events I had a lot of help with through the newspaper articles, the feelings just came back naturally, the overwhelming feelings that I felt at the time. Uh, my degree is in English. I got that from, I'm not going to say which university, but it's located in Starkville. <laughs> <laughs> I got my degree in English in 1976, and I got my teaching certificate at the same time, but I had never taught until I got to Colorado. So the English degree helped a lot. Um, the process, of writing it was just pure fun, just the vocabulary and, and, and doing all of that and, and getting, it, getting it ready. But I had no intention until I was well into it of ever sending it off. And then I sent it to my daughter, who's a human rights attorney in Geneva, Switzerland, little Lizzie, who was eight. She's a human rights attorney for the, Red, the International Red Cross in Geneva. She's been there 15 years. I uh, sent it to her and my son, Matt, uh, who is in the tech sector in Vail, Colorado. And so I uh, enjoyed I enjoyed getting their input. I wasn't sure if it would be positive, and more importantly, I wasn't sure if they approved of my, not airing the dirty laundry. We certainly did nothing to be ashamed of, but bringing back memories, I guess. But they were both fully on board, uh, and, and they loved it, and they supported it. So I started sending it to a few other people here and there, and they were all pretty supportive. And so I have a good friend in Jackson who said, you really need to send this to University Press, and of course I'm not. There's no way anybody's going to want to publish this book. She said, well, just, just do it. So I sent it to University Press, and they snapped it up immediately. That's the only people I sent it to. I didn't have an agent. I was very, very lucky to, uh, to I realized that is not your typical journey to try to get a book published. I was very fortunate. Um, and they snapped it up immediately because, of course, it is a Mississippi story. That's about as Mississippi as you can get. And so they snatched it up and started uh, running with it with the marketing. And it, it took two years to get it published, I think, maybe not quite, from beginning to end. So I've been waiting for this spring for about two years now uh, to get it out there. And it is, the reception has been unbelievable. They sold 2,000 books before it was even released, which was the entire first edition, before it was even released on pre-orders, and where else but Mississippi would you, <laughs> would you find somebody that, who's that appreciative of, of literature and, and of their native daughters? I don't think that's just anywhere. So that's kind of the process. It really wasn't a, the writing itself was not difficult, and it wasn't a chronological thing. I would think of something and then go back and expand. A lot, of, a lot about the Delta in there. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, can you tell me about the cover? Yes, the cover. Thank you for asking that. This is the cover, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of people think that that's metaphorical, the Delta in the rearview mirror, but actually it was, it's based on something that was quite literal, which is when we were leaving that day that I just uh, read about, when we were leaving that day, just, I'm not going to lie, I was on antidepressants by then, I was on sleeping pills by then, I was pretty numb to a lot of things. In the packing, I, we left some of our most valuable things at home because we couldn't fit them on the truck and then brought stuff like a, outfits that my daughter had outgrown 40 years before. It was just, it was just no logic as we were throwing things in the car. As we crossed the bridge, at, uh, at Mississippi, at the, on the Mississippi River, as we crossed that bridge, I remember looking into the rearview mirror, but I wasn't driving. I remember looking into the side mirror, rearview mirror, and seeing the cotton fields. This was December, just seeing the cotton fields recede 
blowing in the wind. It was a terrible winter day. They were blowing in the wind, and I could just see the billboards and everything I had grown up knowing and loving. I could just see them recede. And then we hit the bridge and with a bump, and I saw the, the girders on the bridge, and I, I remember looking over and seeing a towboat down there turning around. All this was in the rearview mirror. And then we hit Arkansas, and when, when I hit, when we hit the border of Arkansas, I remember thinking, taking a deep breath and saying to myself, I think we have outrun the devil himself. So it was quite the literal, as well as, as you know, figurative rear view mirror. Anything else? Yes. Uh, one of the things I remember most about Charles Wine was the beautiful labels. Yes. That you have. Who, who designed those for you? My husband, Sam Rushing. <laughs> he is an artist also. He designed a lot of them. We had some help uh, with a place called Magnolia Label. Is that right, Sam? Yeah. Back in the day? Yeah, it was Jackson. And Jim Seal. Jim Seal. Yeah, yeah. He was the Yeah. So we had some help. We had a lot of help, but he did it. And it was kind of sad because we had designed a wonderful label based on the Mississippi Delta Blues singers that we were about to come out with some new wines when all of that happened. So we weren't able to follow through with that. So anything else? Yes. Will we find out who murdered? Um, you'll, yes, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> Yes, okay. Yes, you do. Yes, you find out. And, and it's a very sad story. To me, this that's even sadder than what happened to us because lives were lost. But uh, it's... I talk in the end of the book about, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, you know, the, the hatred, the resentment, the intergenerational trauma that we tend to pass down. Well, and we're all we're all victims of it. Some worse than others. You know, I grew up in a house that was very about as middle class as you can get in Greenville, Mississippi. But our, my family's stories were always stories of optimism and and happiness and and victory and in small things in life, not in big things in life. And I, I doubt I doubt that that was the case in that household across the river. I doubt seriously that was the case. So, sad. Anything else? Ty? Yes. Uh, hey. I, I, as one of your close friends way back then, I suffered yeah. through this as, as well as anybody else in the Delta. In the trial itself, it was a miscarriage of justice, I think you agree. Yes. What would you attribute that to mostly? Yeah. Good question. Uh. Uh, <laughs> what's in my heart is not something that I can articulate. As I mentioned, it, it just kind of boiled down to the haves versus the have-nots. I think a lot of it was our, everyone in the Delta, as I'm sure you remember, was sure that he was going to, he confessed for crying out loud. He confessed to everything except the, the theft of $400. So I don't know if the jury was just locked on that or if there were some things going on behind the scenes that we weren't aware of. We were sequestered during the whole thing, and Sam and I tried to get the trial records, but we never could, not long after we moved. We had a, a writer who flew in from Canada who wanted to write her story, and we were never able to get the records, and we never knew why we couldn't get them. So we really weren't there during the trial. We were holed up in a little room in the back. And uh, so we don't really know what went down. And I have my suspicions, but they're, they're based on absolutely nothing I can prove. So I don't know. I really don't. Anything else? Maybe I'll have another book coming about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to get a lawyer on the board for that one. <laughs> on a brighter note. Yes. Uh -huh. At that particular time, and we had several of our meetings and lunches at the tea room. The food was delicious, everything was great, and the wine was the best. 
Thank you. The wine muffins are great. Yeah, they were. Thank you. And you know, one of the one of the strange things that has happened with this is people are buying the book and they also said, but I don't, I want a cookbook. Mine's worn out or I want to give one to my daughter or my granddaughter. So we are going to reprint the cookbook. That's my project <laughs> for the summer. So, <laughs> so this company that did it's out of business. It was up in Memphis, Wimmer Brothers. But, uh, I'm just going to do it independently and... So I'll keep the bookstores in my in, in the loop on that. So, I mean, my cookbook is worn out. I, we kept about five cases that I've kind of given to people over the years. And but it was interesting when Katrina hit. I had like five phone calls from people on the coast who said, I lost my cookbook and I miss it just as much as anything. So I did send all of them a cookbook, um, free of charge, of course. I was crying every time I sent it, but... So I, I, but I'm, out, I'm pretty much down to like six or seven myself. So I am going to reprint that. We'll see. We'll see how that how that does. I'm excited about that. Anything else? Yes. Do you think this will be a movie? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I have. I have, right now I'm just trying to get to Jackson. Okay. <laughs> You know, I've had a lot of people say that it would lend itself well to a movie. It, it probably would, but they better get somebody real cute to play me. <laughs> <laughs> or they're going to be in trouble. So who knows? Who knows? And I don't know how, you know, I don't, I don't know. Anything else? Okay, well, I just want to thank you all so much for your time. I am here. I'll be glad to sign the books. I don't know. I don't know where Maya wants me to, to do that. Oh, there you are. I'm not sure where you, over here. She's got a spot for me. So I'll be happy to do that. But the last thing I want to say is thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for caring. Thank you so much for remembering the great days of the winery and the tea room. But most of all, thank you for being still the most wonderful people on earth. I appreciate it. Thank you.